Hello, everybody. My name is Kai. I'm a member of the social media fleet here at Mysterious Galaxy. And today we are celebrating the release oh. of Ernesto Cisneros' book, Falling Short, and Kelly Yang's book, New From Here. Yay! Yeah. Um, both books right Yay. here. Such beautiful, beautiful covers. So creative. Oh, I love that we all have that. <laughs> okay. We apologize for the late start as there were technical difficulties as there have been for many events before, but we are here now and we're ready to talk. So Ernesto Cisneros, uh, uh, his first novel won the uh, Children's Author Award, which is really super awesome. And he strives to reflect the diverse backgrounds and perspectives through the book we're celebrating today. And Kelly Yang is a best time, uh, New York best times, sorry. Oh my gosh. New York Times best selling author who has also won a number of awards, including the 2019 Asian Pacific American Award for Children's Literature. So both really talented people that we have here today. Um, some pre-event reminders, uh, Ernesto and Kelly will be doing in audience Q&A around the 30-ish minute mark. So be sure to submit all your questions to the ask a question tab below. And this is an exciting reminder that the books and signed book plates are available through Mysterious Galaxy's website. Thank you, Ernesto and Kelly, for doing that. You can find the link for that in the shiny green box below that reads uh, by Falling Short and You From Here and signed book plates. And um, something to keep in mind is that we do have limited stock of one of the books. So if you are planning to grab either one of them, it's better to do it sooner than later. As always, your purchase of books through Mysterious Galaxy helps us as an indie bookstore to keep doing such wonderful events like this. And okay, I know you're not here to watch me talk, so I'm going to disappear in just a moment. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Ernesto Sustaneros and Kelly Yang. Yay! <laughs> it's so good to see you. Yes, yes, it's really nice. I, I love this. I love this. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This is this is uh, going to be a lot of fun. So uh, I so loved fun. loved your book, um, and I want to ask. I want to start by asking you, what was the inspiration behind this amazing piece of literature? Oh, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. That means a lot, especially coming from you. Um, so I'm I'm I. I cannot lie, when After F and Divided came out, I needed to work on my second book and I had to channel some of the feelings that I was having about the fears of falling short. Um, so I was feeling a lot of trepidation, a lot of fear um, about how do you follow up your, you know, your sophomore book and I was feeling the pressure. And so I went back to a lot of my, um, just my childhood memories, like all the things that I really hold close to myself and, uh, and dear. And so I just kind of channeled a little bit about of myself. So I was not a very athletic child. So that's where a little bit where Marco came from. And I was also not the the best scholar either. And so I kind of just split my personalities up a little bit to two characters. Um, I love that. Kind of, I love that. Yeah, and I and I really wanted to just highlight. Uh, these are two amazing kids, and. Um, I really wanted to highlight that for 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 kids, the readers, and I want them to fall in love with Marco and Isaac. And then after they fall in love with them, I want them to realize that the reason they're falling in love with them is because they're such nice children. And at school, I'm a school teacher also, and I find that we give awards to kids who uh, have, you know, they make the principal's honors honor roll. We give trophies to athletes, but we don't give awards and prizes, accolades to people who are just you know, genuinely nice people. Uh, and so that that's kind of where that book kind of was born from. Oh, I love but, that uh, so much. And oh, I, I cannot agree more. I think, you know, a huge, I was just talking about this today. I think a huge part of our society just focuses on success. And kids start internalizing that and start feeling like I have to be the best or I'm not anyone. And I, I love that so much about this story because these are kids who are not afraid to admit that, you know, they're – they're worried about things that they have things that there's there's that are going on at home that they're worried about but there's also things that they're worried about for themselves um and especially this concept of feeling falling short i mean i certainly can totally relate to that um and i want to ask you like so much of your writing the reason why it's so good is you've got these really relatable very real things particularly at school but also at home and how hard is it to come up with those themes? Um, 
you know, once you create, I'm a character writer. So one, I feel like once you have your character set, that's the hard part for me. And the rest of it is just kind of letting them go loose and be who they want to be. Uh, but I definitely have to channel some of the experiences, all the, all the memories that left a mark with me growing up, they're there. And a lot of my memories are fading, but um, a lot of them are still there. And there's a reason why they're still there. It's because they're super important to me. And then sometimes I'll see memories that I have, and then I'll be reminded of uh, something going on in my classroom as a teacher. And then I realize that some of those things are still happening now. So, for example, I remember when I was teaching uh, middle, um, elementary, we had a little girl who uh, we went on a field trip. Her dad came to pick her up, and he you could tell he had been drinking a little bit. So as a teacher, we definitely could not allow that, that little girl to go with them. And we, and, you know, we had to make a report. And, uh, and I had a very similar experience growing up, too. And I knew that it was something that kids do go through. And I wanted to just kind of help them to navigate through those tough situations. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that both of our books have that in common, is not being afraid to tackle some of the tough, tougher issues. And I, I often, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get emails from people going, why are you writing about loan sharks? <laughs> what is wrong? Um, and it's always, it's like, it's a little embarrassing because it's like, well, because I've heard a lot of people talking about that in my house, you know? Um, and, and and do you, how do you get over that fear of like how the world is going to, to judge or to, you know, to think about, um, about some of these harder topics, especially now with a lot of parents going, well, this is not, this is too, um, you know, this is too controversial for my kid. You know, I, I don't write my books for the adults. I, I really don't. And in my classroom, I have a little blue box that I have by my door. And if any child is going through something, they just put a little um, a note for me. And through the years, they put things on, on there. Uh, so when they walk in, they copy their agenda and they'll put a little note in the box saying, you know, my parents are fighting last night. I couldn't go to sleep. So I, so Mr. C, if I fall asleep in class, don't take it personally, please. I don't mean to, you know, to, to do that. Uh, they've given me tons of notes like that. So I, I know that these kids are going through these issues. And honestly, books are kind of like their lifelines. Uh, and that's just my take on it. So those books are written for those children. But um, I've got a question for you. One okay. thing that <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm such a big, huge fan of yours is that you do something that I absolutely love. You do not do the Disney thing where you get okay. rid of the families. You actually like we get to meet the entire family. And honestly, when I felt this, I felt like I could I knew I felt like I knew your family really well after reading this book. Um, and I miss them afterwards. I'm like, wait, uh, how, why am I no longer hanging out with this amazing family anymore? Um, what's your take on including the family members? Because a lot of people kind of, they they work really hard at getting rid of them. They either kill off the parents, they send them on a trip, or they do something where we cannot, we, we can't seem to interact with the main characters. What's your philosophy? Oh, uh, I... You know, very similar to you, um, I, first of all, I just want to say before we talk about my book, I just want to say how amazing it is that you have this block system. Like I used to be a teacher as well. So I'm always just, first of all, just nothing but respect and love for teachers and just so much gratitude. Um, I was, I was a teacher, so I know how hard that job is. And like, I have a million questions for you after, after I ask this one. I want to know, like, I mean, it's so mind blowing and cool, like for your kids to have you as a teacher. I mean, are you just getting kids must be just like going just completely bananas, you know, like what? My teacher is an amazing superstar author. Like how cool. I wish I was one of your students. Anyways, to answer your question, um, I love writing adult characters alongside children because i see the story not really as just a kid's story um my work i i see my stories as you know a snapshot into this family or into this situation like a deep dive into like almost as an anthropologist like deep dive into this community what's going on the other reason is i was actually a journalist before becoming a novelist. Um, so whenever I go into um, communities, I am always talking 
to everyone. You know, I want to talk to um, the I want to talk to the kid on the school bus, but I also want to talk to the bus driver. I also want to talk to the um, person who works in the cafeteria. You know, I want to I want to talk to everyone because that's just kind of the way um, my brain works. And also growing up, I think it was because growing up we always had a lot of aunts and uncles around i mean i'm it's probably the same with you um from reading your books just you know they weren't real aunts and uncles they were like my parents friends and i had to call them like auntie like auntie wong or auntie so and so and it almost became like that i was either just a really small adult in the room with a lot of other adults or that they became sort of my peers because they were a constant in my life. Was, they were there and the weeklies were there and those are all adults. So I've always been immersed in these multi-generational environments. Um, and also just, I come from a big family, you know, I'm an only child, but I have lots of cousins, my grandparents, so on and so forth. And that was always the sort of dynamic. Like you could not capture a family dinner without reporting on what, you know, so-and-so said and what grandma, how she responded and, and so on and so forth. Yes, yes. Oh, great, great that, answer. Is that similar to your experience growing up? Um, um, yes, you know, I've always thought that if you actually took our parents and just kind of flipped them, like if we swap parents over the, for the weekend, I think that we would like realize that they're very similar. Um, just with the dynamics that, that you describe, it, that sounds like my family too. Um, there is a question that, that I'd like to ask you too though. Let's see, the question is, what message are you hoping to get across to the parents who are reading this with their kids? That's Ooh, a good question. Um, are you asking me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, so my main message with um, New From Here is just that, you know, we're all going through a tough situation with this pandemic. And we can get mad and we can blame and we can scream at each other and we can take a very hateful, nasty approach. Or we can see that we're all going through a similar situation and that there's so much commonality there, there's so much community there um there's community in that in that frustration and there's community in that um you know going through something together and my big message is that you know for kids that they're not alone that this has been a really hard couple of years for all of us um but reading their stories i've, I've gotten so many kids to submit stories to me and reading their stories has been just a very life-changing experience, truly. Um, I have read some of the most amazing stories these last few weeks because they, I've invited kids to submit them to my website and we've published over 500 stories. So I've been getting stories from all over the world, you know, from India and from Europe and all over the U.S. Um, and some of them are just, I mean, so emotional. Um, but also it really, I believe that stories heal us. And I was a kid who needed a lot of healing. You know, life was hard. I wasn't sure what was going to happen ever, pretty much. My parents could not give me a really stable life. I mean, they, they tried. They really tried. But it was like, OK, we're moving again. OK, we're moving again. And I was always the new kid. And so books really provided me with that ability to heal. How about you? What is the message that you're giving kids in this amazing work? I think I, I, it, it's a little bit of a mixture of I want them to feel seen and to just know that we all feel that way. Um, I mean, like you, you are a not only a New York Times bestselling author, but you were number one, uh, <laughs> New York, number one spot uh, bestselling author. Um, and yet I imagine that there's still days that you kind of question yourself whether you're going to be able to finish the next book that we all have the same type of fears and anxieties. It's just that we don't talk about them. And so right. I want kids to, to just to realize that it's completely normal. Uh, mm -hmm. These fears, you know, and, and, and for the parents to just be reminded a little bit about that your kids do uh, absorb everything around them. They do internalize everything that they're hearing. And so the best thing we can do is to actually have the conversations with their, with their children. Uh, when my kids were in middle school, I don't remember the actual event, but I remember it was something that was kind of horrific that happened, um, and it was all over the news. Um, I don't believe it was 9-11. It was a little bit later than that. Um, and I was kind of trying to shelter my own children from these things. And I, when they came home, I got lectured. 
and like I had never gotten lectured before and it was just a reversal of the roles and my my kids were just very upset with me because they said we went unprepared to school we saw the images at school we heard people talking about them and we didn't know how to respond because you're overprotecting us and right. so from that day on I realized I, I can't just keep things away from my kids I need to have the dis important discussions with them so that they can you know know, know how to move on from them I love that. That is so important. It was the same when I was a teacher as well. I would talk about wars. I would talk about things that were going on because they're going on. And, you know, you, we, we underestimate how much kids are so aware. They're so smart. They're so aware of everything that's going on. They're really aware of the family dynamics, too, which is another thing I love about your writing is, is all those little moments, you know, all those little moments where you're picking up on all these cues and you're you know like that moment where marco's he's um his dad's girlfriend's son you know and he's like oh gosh like i you know that feeling of like why am i not there and also is this kid gonna replace me and all these things and we've all felt that way um we've all felt that way in some form or another i remember my mom like playing with one of my cousins and i got so mad <laughs> It's like really embarrassing, but I think I like completely stomped out of the pool. I was so mad. and then I was so embarrassed that I behaved that way. But it was because my mom had so little time off. She was always working, always cleaning rooms. Um, she was a hotel maid. Like she was so busy cleaning, and her one like hour off, she was my little cousin and I just couldn't handle it <laughs> um, and later on I would like cry and tell her I'm so sorry and then I have to go apologize to my cousin which is like so humiliating <laughs> <laughs> funny that's funny well it looks like we have uh two more questions here uh so okay. let me go ahead and ask you one of these well uh what was the favorite scene to write in the book without giving too many spoilers oh that's a tough question a tough one um i i definitely love the scenes of okay so there is a very epic garage sale in this book first of all i love garage sales i'm a sucker for garage sales every time i see one i pretty much pull over um but i've always wondered about accidentally selling something valuable in the garage sale and that's because i've actually bought things that seem really valuable and i'm always like you sure you should be selling this? Um, so let's just put it this way. There's an epic garage sale in the story. It gets the kids into a lot of trouble and it just goes on and on and on and on and on with how they can possibly remedy the situation. Um, that was probably my favorite thing to write. It was so fun. Nice, nice. How about you? Um, you know, I had a lot of fun with this book. Um, but I, I think my favorite moments are the ones that I was able to channel some of the things from school. So I've been teaching for this is my 27th year. The stories I can I can tell you of things that happen. Uh, I mean, every other day I come home and I tell my wife, you are not going to believe what happened to me. <laughs> and she's like, all right, tell me, let's, let's see if this is a new one or not. Um, and so I, I got to channel a lot of those experiences and I got to write about them. And that's so great. throughout here, there's a lot of a lot of the humor that's that you find in this book. It's things that actually happened either in my classroom or around the school, or to you know. Um, and I, I I love writing about those things, and I just have a it's it's fun. So but if I you had to pick one, if you had to pick one favorite favorite, scene, I'm gonna make you do it. Um, what what would it be? It's um it's actually not a, a funny moment. It's a moment where Marco is actually sitting outside on the uh the driveway uh, on the side on the curb and he's waiting for his dad because his dad promised he was going to take me to disneyland and he's holding the, the ticket and the dad doesn't show up and so um, isaac's dad sees him out there um and he decides to kind of be like the foster parent in a way uh, i remember growing up i had a friend uh hey george if you're out there shout out to your dad too um and his his dad was he was really amazing he would always be like a surrogate dad when my dad wasn't available mm -hmm. and so i remember like him taking us to Chuck E. cheese and then he would just give us 20 dollars and just let us go and he would just leave he would stay with us and he'd come back a few hours later it was just um it's really nice that when and at least in my in my community when somebody isn't able to be a parent because they're working all day long there's always part of the community that steps up 
Um, and so that's that's why that's my favorite scene. It was really powerful. Um, and it, it was kind of inspired from a scene from Maniac McGee too. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, yes, one of my favorite books. Yeah, so and I love that, that you know you're it really made me cry too. I was I was weeping when I was writing that that chapter. Oh, I know. You know when a book is good when you're when you're starting to cry <laughs> as you're writing it. You're like, yes, I'm nailing it, <laughs> and you're weeping. <laughs> you're like grabbing. <laughs> um, I have, I have a lot of questions for you about your process. I mean, first of all, what does your writing day look like? I know you're teaching, so is this happening? after school during lunch how's this how is this happening and do you outline before you write or are you a pantser um i do make outlines in fact i'm not sure if i have one right here next to mine but so they, look, you guys. They, look <laughs> like they look like this oh wow. just, it's, like, it's like a storyline but i i to be honest i look at the first three squares and then my characters don't want to listen to me anymore, so I end up doing this. And, uh, and oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And so, I, but I do you do you still like, even though you're kind of um, going off right with your characters, are you still adhering to some of the major points of the story, or are you really just kind of like taking I'm it wherever? I'm trying to. Yeah. I I try to, but my characters just are a little stubborn at times, and uh, they want to do what they want to do. And uh, as long as they don't change the entire story, sometimes it's a, it's a wonderful thing. There are times where you write a chapter and you love it. And then you're like, oh, I'm sorry. We have to kind of rewind a little bit because, you know, it doesn't quite fit the storyline. But um, every day I, I, I try and write for one hour. So during nutrition, the kids leave my classroom. And if I don't have something pressing, I can sit there and try and write for 10 minutes. And then for lunch comes over and I'll try and get 15 to 20 minutes then. And then I look at the clock after school and I'm like, I don't have much left to make that hour and then i'll start writing there and then when i come home if i didn't make the hour if i just went over sometimes just because you're in that rhythm and then i'll just before going to bed i'll be able to put in like another hour or sometimes two so at minimum i do one hour and sometimes it ends up being three four uh, i mean there's times i've gone to the desk and it's like oh my god it's 3 30 in the morning uh, i gotta get to bed so uh, how about you? What's your process like? Um, I I do outline a lot um, and I basically kind of stick to my outline. Although sometimes I sometimes characters will surprise me too. Sometimes um, the way that it's written, uh, they'll just start having more of a personality and then I'm like developing, you know, their own arc for them and, you know, little side problems and side stories um so it's 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 always like a big rubik's cube trying to try to make it all fit together and work um but yeah i i am a huge planner because i hate getting stuck i really like do you ever get stuck does that happen to you yes okay, I, so I got stuck with, with that friend divided i didn't know how to finish the book um actually i got stuck with well, actually uh, to be honest i got stuck on both books because I feel like the first chapter is the, the most difficult one, but the same can be said about the last one too. Right. And so those right. are like yeah. each one is like 30 different revisions for me. Uh, and just yeah. trying to figure out what works and what works. Uh, is that similar for you? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, the other thing that I do a lot, unfortunately, is that I am a terrible first drafter. I write like not great first drafts. Let's put it that way. I would. <laughs> I don't want to swear on this, but definitely not great. Um, so I, unfortunately, am one of those people who have to have to go back and rewrite. I just finished. Um, I just finished a novel rewrite today. Like I had to completely rewrite this thing from scratch because it was in terrible shape when I turned it in, and my editor was like, "What is this?" Um, so <laughs> I, like, despite all my plans and despite you know thinking I know what I'm doing, I fail a lot. And that's what I love about your book, because I think that is one of the most important messages we can tell kids. And I tell kids this in every single school visit I do, which is that I am not a perfect writer. I am a terrible first drafter. And that's okay. I fail sometimes over and over again. <laughs> like there have been books. I mean, front desk I wrote, I had to do three whole drafts. Like they were totally different drafts. Um, but part of what I think is kind of cool about that is that I have been spending more time with the characters. 
um, in that way, you know, because three drafts later, I really know them. And so I can actually um, put things in the story that wouldn't even occur to me on the first draft. Very true, very true. Yes, and let's see, um, there's a fourth question up here that just popped up. Uh, let's see, oh, this, this is a, a nice one. How involved were you in the creation of the cover? Can you tell us about the process? Ooh, uh, well, why don't you start with that one? I love your cover, it's so great. Really, really I, have, I I agree. You know how they say don't judge a book by its cover? As long as I keep working with uh, with Jay Ben, um, I am fine with people judging my books by by all means. Uh yeah, I mean, yeah, she 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 has just been amazing. You know what? Um so I'm over with Quill Tree. Uh it's a division of um uh of Harper Collins. And as an author, usually you don't always have a lot of say in the covers. Like legally, technically, I'm not supposed to have any, I don't believe. But my editor, Rosemary, is amazing. And the artist is amazing. And she always writes to me. She reads the books. And then she contacts me. And she asks me, what do you think your characters look like? Um, and, and and she's so caring about that. We'll go back and forth with, you know, we'll talk over the phone. And uh, and she's just been so amazing. So I, I got, I was honored by being able to place the school where I used to work, Rio Pico Elementary, with the apartments of Fort Rent sign. One of my students threw that, that sneaker over there that's hanging from the power, uh, power supply, uh, the cables. Um, this is actually what my nephew actually looks like, Marco, in real life. Oh, um, I think I so, saw this picture. I think I saw yeah, this. So, I've been just blessed uh, to be working with such an amazing house uh, that just allows me to have a little bit of input. Uh, that is amazing. How, how about you? And yeah, first yeah. of all, like I love all the details. Like I think I have a copy of Efron, but it's not right. It's not um, upstairs. But I love all the details. I think that those are the details that kids, when they pick up a book, they love those details, like the sneaker, oh, just perfect. Um, I have had the great pleasure of working with an amazing um, illustrator for pretty much all of my middle grade. Um, so Mikey Plensky has illustrated the entire Funfest series, um, starting with the first one. And it was hard because we wanted to make sure that Mia looked like a, for me, it was important that Mia looked like she was a take charge kind of girl, like she was a take charge kid, right? And she totally looks this way. And I was like, you got to give her, you know, some wild hair because my hair is always a mess. Like no matter what I do, it, like right now it actually looks pretty good, I have to say. I'm having like a good day. <laughs> but usually it's a mess and there are like there are so many like TV interviews I'm doing where there's just one strand that's like going like this and I'm always looking at this video going why didn't anyone fix that one strand why is it doing that <laughs> so anyway um Mia that's why her hair is always a mess um but that was like a detail that I really wanted and then I love that um, Mikey actually she loves reading <laughs> so this is really funny but she loves reading my manuscripts before she starts drawing, which was normally like, that's great and that's fine. But on the last book that I did, it was a problem because the first draft was terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, but she had to draw it anyway. And she would send me little messages going, I think this needs work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> and, um, but, and so, it was really funny because I decided that I was going to write write the book, um, but we were we had this cover, and so then I was frantically emailing them, going, "Stop the cover! Stop the cover! Or at least don't draw all of it. Like, let's leave some parts, you know, undone until the end." Um, and then I started thinking, like, should I write a book for a cover? <laughs> like, should I do that? Um, but I realized that that was you know, a fool's errand. You can't write a book for a cover. So <laughs> so hopefully the good people at Simon & Schuster don't kill me, but the draft is now excellent. So that's good. <laughs> well, we're all really excited about, you know, being able to read that someday soon. Um, so let's see, I have another question here. What What is a piece of advice that you, um, you want to give to a kid who is going through the same thing as your main characters? Yeah, I would love to hear your advice. I mean, especially this whole feeling of falling short, which I could totally relate to 
you know, because um, like just on this last book, I, I felt like I had failed. I really did. I mean, not only because the cover artist was texting me and <laughs> saying that it was a problem, but because I knew it wasn't that good. And but I had to turn it in anyway, because like I needed to turn it in. Um, but it, it, it nagged me and it like it really ate at me. And I felt like I was letting everyone down i was letting myself down and it really i don't know I, and it was so emotionally hard to get over that feeling and to finally find the courage to try again so i want to ask you for people dealing with that like how do you how do you um you know find that courage you know i, I think we all have, i think the secret is just knowing that we're not alone and that you and that everybody has somebody who you can go to and, and that's something that I've always tried to just, um, um, something I want to communicate through my, my work. Um, so it might be a best friend that you can find in, it might be your teacher, it might be a counselor, but there's definitely people who we can uh, talk to about these things, especially right now during the pandemic, which is uh, what I like so much about your book too, that there's a lot of, um, um, what's the right word? Not, not the residue, but there's a lot of, um, like in, being in the classroom, a lot of the kids are going through very difficult times. And the pandemic was not equal to everybody. Everybody uh, experienced it a little bit differently. So I love uh, hearing about your experience that, that you were going through. Um, and plus, you know, I love the way that your your characters all have a lot of, you give them agency. And they, and they model not being victims, but going out there and doing something too. Uh, that's yes. something that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of. I, I just feel that if we're gonna, we are gonna be writing about tough uh, uh, topics, we do need to give kids, leave them with agency. Yeah, um, I think that's did so I important. kind of answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're right because I think that that's what helped me get through it. Like, I have a few really close author friends. You're one of them, and I love that we're able to have these really real conversations. Like, no one is trying to pretend like it's all perfect you know and i think we need to have more of them like again this is why your book is so important because i think that this generation of kids they have so much social media and they see one side which is the highlights you know and i don't want my kids to be afraid to fail or to live in fear and terror that that's going to happen to them and they won't know how to bounce back um, so that's something that like I've been talking about. It's just making kids feel less alone in that experience and just letting them know like even the top people do do fail like all the time, like all the time. Um, I mean, it's painful, but <laughs> it happens. And then and that's, yeah. Uh, I think no, I can agree with you. And I, I, I love that, you know, and you guys are hearing the, you know, a number one New York Times bestselling author telling you that they, the first drafts is, isn't very good. Uh, so that, that's amazing, <laughs> that, you know, here. It, it really is because, you know, it, it's that, um, what is it, foaming kind of syndrome that we, we experience. I know that in my in my hallway, I have a picture, a photo of my son, and he's dressed like a little baby Santa. And he's got the biggest smile you've ever seen, and he just looks like he's just having the best time. But anybody who was there knows that he was crying for like an hour. And then finally, right before we were done with the photo shoot, he decides to finally smile. And so it just gives the illusion that we were having a wonderful time. We were all miserable at that day. And I feel like social media does the same thing, right? You see other people and they're smiling and they're eating at a restaurant. Uh, we don't see the fact that they were waiting in a, an hour to get into it. We don't see that the, the food was cold or that it was really hot outside or cold, it's raining. We just see that picture and we just kind of feel like their lives are better than ours. So uh, I, I completely, completely agree with you on that. Absolutely, I think it's so important. Um, and I mean, for your kids, like how do you teach them that resilience? My own, like my own kids at home? Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, first of all, do you ever think about that? Like I think about that sometimes for my kids because I think that they see how, you know, I wrote a book and it became really popular and it, it was it was kind of an accident, you know, like I didn't know it was going to do really well, <laughs> but I'm always worried about that, like that, that they think that 
success comes easily. And when it doesn't for them, that they'll be so let down. And so it'll be so hard for them to process that. Um, I think this is a problem for like all children, but particularly children who are around uh, what they think is instant success. And I think yeah. you are, I think you are one of them. I think you are, in, you're like, you are one of the most beloved children's book authors in the world. I am always in awe of your books. And so I want to ask you, how do you prepare your children for, um, for letdown? And, and also yourself, if, you know, if that's ever something that you think about. Well, the first thing I've, I've, I've always made it a point to do is to always never hide my imperfections. And they get to see me. I want them to see me fail. Uh, my son's at college right now. And he made a comment to me the other day about it because I, I asked, he, he got himself a job. I never asked him to get a job. He's a tutor. So he's teaching calculus to, to the kids over there at school and, you know, physics and all that kind of stuff. Things are over my head. But, um, and I asked him, or just be careful because I think you're working a little too hard. And, and my son, it, it's just really stuck to me that he goes, but dad, when you were in college, you were working 60 hours plus to pay for your school. I'm only working 15 to 20 hours. I'm not even doing half of what you were doing. And mm -hmm. so I, I need to remind them that yes, but my grades were horrible because of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm always just, I don't want them to compare and I want them to see all the flaws and all the mistakes. I never hide those things because I don't want them to think, well, my dad's an award-winning author. I have to do this. And it's not, I just want them just like with the falling short. I just want them to be nice, genuine, you know, really nice people. And they already are. So I'm like, You've already fulfilled all, all any expectation I have. That that's it. That that's all I really want. Uh, when it, when Aww, the, that is so end. sweet. That is so special. Yeah, and I mean, like in uh, New From Here, where is that? Yes, I think it's true. Okay. <laughs> in New From Here, um, the fact that you know, I, I love that. Um, there's there's a crazy adventures of the kids, so that's great. But they're also learning about their mom. And by the way, I am I am the mom in the story. So I knew it. I knew it. I know <laughs> some people are. I mean, a lot of people online are just like, "What is wrong with this mom? All she does is stay in her room, and she has no idea what's going. What kind of a mother has no idea what's going on with her kids?" I'm like, "How do you think you got this book?" You know? <laughs> I had to. I had to parent three kids during the pandemic. What more do you want from me? Um, no, but seriously, I love that the kids in the book um learn more about their mom's feelings and and she's proud of them she's like this is the time i got a really bad grade from this professor who just didn't take me seriously um this is the time you know i had to change my name because again people didn't take me seriously with my chinese name or whatever so and the reading i think it's it's so empowering for kids to read about that because they always have those kind of doubts about themselves and to see an adult be confident talking about their, you know, low lights instead of just their highlights is so powerful. <laughs> like, I really think we all need to talk about this much more. Um, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> yes, yes. Now I have a question for you about your book. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a feeling that the mom was based on you, uh, <laughs> just from, from what I know of you. But uh, if there's a section that was the most fictitious aspect of the story, what what was that part where you had to kind of deviate in order to, you know, to to work on the story? Yeah, oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think that there's there's definitely so many parallels. It, it was kind of like an account of what happened. Um, my kids did not dress up in dinosaur suits. So that was, <laughs> that was a deviation. I mean, the whole like, there, there are villains in the story because in the pandemic, I mean, I'm sorry, there were some villains. There are people who hoarded masks and sold them at exorbitant prices. Like that's just, you know, why did you need to do that, right? We had healthcare workers wearing like t-shirt masks, you know? I remember this because my mom was trying to make them for them um, and she mailed off like a whole bunch to a hospital. I was like, well, that's amazing mom, but they shouldn't have to be wearing these things made of like, you know your tank top <laughs> so i was really um just terribly upset by a lot of that and um i did weave it into the story and so there are some people that are experiencing the pandemic in a very profitable way 
Um, and the kids definitely have a lot of issues with that and go and try to find those guys. Um, that was that was definitely not real in the sense that I never, you know, personally stalked any um, mass orders. <laughs> um, but I did run out of toilet paper, which was a real problem. <laughs> uh, you say we all ended up, we all have experience of what it, um, what do we call the exfoliating toilet paper? Yes, well, we had to buy a really cheap. You were stuff. telling me I had them too. I had to. I had to use these. Um, these are the <laughs> the tissues from Office Depot. They were the only ones left in stock. So I actually have um, probably I don't know like at least twenty more boxes of these in my house. So I'm constantly going around because I bought so much because I thought this was going to happen again. I and I'm constantly going around like, do you want a tissue? You want a tissue? <laughs> And my kids are like, no, take your cheap tissues away from me. <laughs> well, um, there was one topic also that I, I would love to hear uh, you talk about. Um, and, and that's during the pandemic, we saw uh, not the best side of America. Uh, mm -hmm. When it came to the, the treatment and the, some of the comments that were being said about uh, the you know Asian Americans, um, and, and I'm sorry that you had some of those experiences, you know, like personally, but do you want to take a moment to, I mean, that's a really important topic that you were tackling. Would you like to speak a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, I kind of immediately felt it when we got off the plane, uh, we, we moved from Hong Kong, uh, where I actually lived for 15 years. I was a teacher in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, we moved back and it was a very different immigration experience. I had thought it was going to be a lot more pleasant because I could speak English this time, you know, I knew my way around. Um, I, you know, am an American, <laughs> but, um, but this time was actually um, just completely full of this, this, this almost like this filter of like, um, of fear and, and hostility. And we kind of experienced it um, pretty much immediately as soon as we got off because people didn't want to you know they didn't want to have anything to deal with us they didn't want to be standing next to us in line um i think a cab driver did not want to take us and of course then later on i had some more direct um confrontational experiences where people were telling me to go back to where i came from um which was ironic because i did go back to where i came from which is why i'm here <laughs> um but i like I wanted to talk about it in the story because my kids watched some of this, some of these incidents. Um, one was at the dog park. They watched, they witnessed that, and their first reaction was, "We should never talk about that. We should, ne we should just completely let's never mention that happened. Let's never talk about that because it was embarrassing." And I remember growing up and thinking the same thing because I went to, um, I went to one school that was all white. Um, it was in Newport Beach. We were managing a motel down in Newport Beach. And I was the only Chinese kid in the whole school, pretty much. And I always did that. I would always pretend like little things people said did not hurt me. I would brush it off because I wanted to fit in. And I didn't want to be uh, different from everyone else. But then they would eat at me and eat at me and eat at me because I would feel the, um, the double shame of like, so first of all, that it happened and that I was letting myself down because I didn't even stand up for myself. You know, I was just kind of like laughing it off. Ha, ha, ha. And so I wanted to make a point to my kids that this is now, you know, 2022. We're going to talk about things that hurt us if it happens, you know, and hopefully it doesn't happen. But sometimes it does happen. And by having those conversations and bringing it into the light, we can again process and heal so that's my big big thing is that i want to talk about it because that is what a lot of people have gone through and it wasn't just asian americans it was you know the latino community it was a lot of supermarkets i researched this people got turned away um there was a an outbreak at a meat packing factory i think in texas and because of that the the grocery stores refused to serve anybody who looked like what they thought was a meat packer, you know? And a lot of times that was like racially profiled right there. Um, it was a lot of people of color who really went through some hard times in addition to being afraid of the virus and being afraid that we would actually get sick, right? And that was just something that I thought needed to be documented. Um, and I was really happy to be able to weave that into the story and, and make it something that um, is about love. 
you know, because I think that that you know, replacing that hate with love, with humor, with all the like warm feelings that you get reading, you know, a book like New From Here or a book like Falling Short, that is the best way to um, to make the situation better. Well, I love the the fact that you just um, you highlight the inequities that we have, um, and 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 I love the idea that. When I was reading your book, I, first of all, I fell in love with your family, this family, and which is, I guess, your family too. Uh, but then you love the characters so much that when you see them being mistreated, it hurts and you feel the, the outrage. And I think that's when your book is why it's so powerful because, you know, we get upset when we when we see the same scenes happening. So that, you know, uh, kudos to you for just doing such a good job with the family that you, you know, you make us like be like, no, no, leave them alone. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was yelling at the book at some points, like, no, no. <laughs> but you know, that's when you're really enjoying a book when you start talking to it. But uh, let's. So oh, oh. oh. Um, okay. This is going to be a question that I think is going to apply to you a little bit more than me. Um, what's next for the both of you? Uh, well, I have. Oh, I, okay. I can talk about this. I have a new picture book coming out in a few weeks. I think it comes out in like two weeks or something like that. It's called Yes, We Will, and it is about Asian American heroes um, making changes and, and shaping our country and all of the amazing contributions, um, both you know, in terms of historical figures and people who are rocking it today. Um, and you know what? The funny thing was that. This book started off as an Amazon search. Like I was trying to find a book like this for my daughter because I wanted to read something with her at night and just be like, here are all the things we can do. Because growing up, you know, I didn't see anyone looking like me writing kids books and I didn't know that that was possible, you know? And I, my parents certainly did not think it was possible. <laughs> so that didn't really help. Um, so I wanted to find a book like this and I couldn't. And I was like so mad that I couldn't find a book like this. I mean, it's 2022. How can there not be a single book about Asian American biographies in the picture book world, right? Um, so I was emailing my agent and just writing like a, somebody ought to write this book. I can't believe it doesn't exist. And then instead of sending that email to her, I just took the time to basically write this book. And it, it's beautiful. It's, it's illustrated by 15 um, amazing Asian American illustrators and we have you know the, um, the scene that i love of chinese immigrants coming and working on the transcontinental railroad like a lot of people just don't know a lot about asian american history um and we have like jeremy lynn and we have you know astronauts and singers and actors and just the wide breadth of amazing industries that we have made a, a difference in um, yes, it is coming out on May 3rd, um, so I have to do my little plug, and, and it's coming out right in time for Asian American um, Pacific Islander Heritage Month, so please be sure to um, check it out. How about you? Um, well, I'm working on another book, and for some reason, my characters, uh, remember I talked about how my characters don't want to follow my, my storylines that I create? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my characters are going in all sorts of different directions, so... Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm a, a cowboy and I'm trying to just, you know, bring them all in uh, a little bit. So I don't have an actual plot yet, but I have some lovable, adorable characters that I'm super excited about uh, working with. Uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when I was a kid and you're playing with action figures or dolls or whatever. And that's the way I always take of, of writing. I, I'm doing the same thing, except that the, all the action figures are up here uh, once yeah, you create them. I love that. I love that, um, you know, that analogy of like, we're adults, but we're, we can still play. And that's, that's how we play. And I, I think that's another message that we should also tell kids more, just like, you know, we as adults can still imagine and books are an amazing way for us to journey. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody, I noticed that there was a, a few questions. If you guys have any other questions you guys like to ask, uh, just go ahead and click on the ask a question one and uh, put it right on there. Yeah. So let's see, let me see if I missed any of these. Oh, what would you say your main characters, what is your main character's favorite book? Oh, well, actually, I think it's in here. I think, I think his favorite book is, um, 
Is it? Is it oh, it's uh, the one and only Ivan. <laughs> it's in the book. Um, I think it's it's something that the teacher teaches, and he also loves 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 diary of a kid. Um, I wonder what else he likes. He probably he just he's I think he's a huge fan of graphic novels. I was gonna ask you, would you write a graphic novel? Um, someday I would love to. Um, I need to learn how to do that first. <laughs> Not that I knew how to do it first either, but um, yes, at some point I think I would love to do that. I also would love to do a. There's a lot of stories there uh, when my kids were little that I feel like I missed out on. I had the opportunity to write a couple of picture books. So at some point I, I like to write some belated uh, picture books as well. I am here for that. I can't wait. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome back. Hi. Thanks, you guys. This was such a lovely conversation. I love the the talks about diversity and how you guys are being good parents to your children, a good teacher for your Ernesto. It's um, such a valuable conversation, and I'm so glad that we're going to be documenting this um, to our YouTube very soon because this is definitely the conversation that parents need to hear with children uh, at, at the age of your main characters. So thank you guys both for being here. This was awesome. This was such an honor. I loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's such a privilege always to talk to Ernesto. I just think you know, you're so massively talented and we're so lucky to have you in the children's book space. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um... Thank, thank you for inviting me too. And uh, yes, Kelly, I wish we could have done this in person. Um, yeah. You know, that was, that was, <laughs> this, this is, you know, very, very close. Uh, I had a great time. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of your work. And I just, you know, uh, I, I just love that I can, like, you know, I can say, I know, I know, I know Kelly. She's the author. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to definitely do something in person. We'll make that happen. I would love that. Yes, and I love to brag. I have an autographed copy. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. you guys are so awesome. Well, before we go, um, where can we find you guys on social media if you have any? And we could type it in the chat maybe. Yeah. Um, so you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, I'm not really on TikTok. I <laughs> How do you feel about TikTok? I want to ask that question. Uh, me, me. <laughs> yeah, is that something that you're you're doing, or are you like what? Do you have like a love hate relationship with TikTok? <laughs> yeah, TikTok. I'm a little hesitant to to, <laughs> to go there. Um, my that that's the one place where my kids really like my students are there, and I I know that my teaching life and my and my author life have kind of like merged. But TikTok is still something I I, I think I want to stay away from for for a while. But I just, <laughs> just make my Twitter right there at the bottom. And uh, honestly, if you go to my website, you can have all the links to everything, I, all my social media right on there. Yay! Ooh. All right. Super awesome. Thank you again, both of you, for being here. And thank you to the audience for being super amazing and attentive and listening and all that stuff and interacting with each other. So, yeah, good job, you guys. Thank you again. And have a great night and day wherever you are. And Yay. bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.